The Visitor is a Jake Sisko story, which makes it an uphill battle from the start. The thing about the character of Jake is that he was different from pretty much all the other DS9 characters. They were generally created in terms of their function. They have a purpose to fulfill, in other words. Odo is there to handle security, and while he has character elements to him, if all else fails, he has a role to fill on the station and within the show. Jake doesn't have a function in that sense. His purpose was to be there for Sisko to have someone to parent. Sisko has to not just be a commander, but he has to be a father. But that means that Jake has no other purpose, and so the writers weren't entirely sure what to do with him. The big problem with these situations is that showing a balance between work and parenting can often make it seem like the child is selfishly intruding on the more important things that are going on, demanding, either directly or because of their actions, that the parent devote time to the child. As a result, the writers would struggle with him, trying to give him some additional purpose besides getting into trouble, or being scared, or something else that didn't require Cisco, so as to avoid the audience becoming irritated with him. Thus, making Jake a writer instead of going into Starfleet allowed them to separate him from his father, since naturally he would go to his father for advice more if he was following in the man's footsteps than if he was doing something completely unrelated. It still meant that Jake was more of an ancillary character like Lita, who also had no function, but he could be there when called for, and like in this story, would allow him to provide a perspective that was unique to him. And also to show that, while romantic love is a go-to in Hollywood for the strongest bond, this seeks to show that familial love can be just as strong. Most stories with the two are about a father caring for his son. This one turns the roles around. Ironically for Sir Lofton, who was frequently absent from the show because Jake wasn't needed, a great deal of the meat of this episode didn't involve him either, because Jake was played by the versatile and talented Tony Todd. The story begins with elderly writer Jake Sisko, who gets a visitor wandering the bayou while it's pissing down in the middle of the night. Hi, I'm here to borrow a cup of old person. He tends to her injury while she reveals that she's actually here because she admires him so much as a writer and was hoping to learn from him, even claiming to have read his book twice in one night, which would make it a pretty short book if she could accomplish that. The way we first saw Spot, then saw Spot run, and then I was left hanging wondering, were we going to cheer Spot on for running? Yes, run Spot, run! I had to find out what was happening next. This interaction was inspired by a real-life event, actually, when reclusive author J.D. Salinger agreed to talk to a young woman who was an aspiring novelist that showed up out of the blue one day. But actually, she was a reporter aspiring to have an exclusive interview with Salinger that ended in disaster after he'd been willing to indulge this seeming budding young student of his craft. There's your cynicism for the day. Do a good deed and it'll probably be a complete liar who benefits from it. But this young writer is nothing like that at all. She's just stalking an old man through the bio at night. Nothing to worry about there. What she really wants to know is why, after showing such brilliance, he suddenly stopped writing. And so, noting that she's shown up on this day of all days, it must be time to tell this story. The story of how Ben Sisko died. Dun dun dun! The story of how it happened began with Sisko taking Jake onto the Defiance so he can watch the wormhole burp or something. Well, there's a case of spatial acid reflux, because some kind of accident takes place, and Sisko has to head to engineering personally to try to deal with it. Jake follows to offer help, and is actually helpful for the most part, finding the part necessary to finish the Defiance ice cream maker. Which works, but alas, faster than you can say 31 flavors, Sisko is zapped by the warp core and apparently is disintegrated. As the writer girl in the future observes, watching your only living parent disintegrate in front of you can be a bit traumatic. But in Jake's unique case, he can't heal from it. The grieving process is hard enough, especially when you're trying to find some kind of answer when the one person that you would normally turn to for that isn't the one that you're mourning. But you have to let it go, not keep bringing up the ghosts of the past. So it's quite annoying when the ghost of the past shows up one night. Jake, 
These are the chains I forged in life. Naturally, the crew humors him, but nobody really believes that Sisko manifested in Jake's room. But about a year after the accident, Sisko appears again, and they discover that the accident did tech and tech to him, so that tech was keeping him trapped in tech. But luckily, some tech might sort him out. In the meantime, Jake is clearly overwrought at this information, whatever the hell it might mean, that the father that he has been mourning is back, but he won't be staying. In a lot of ways, it's the worst kind of hope, the one that's so slim you cannot dare to take it, and yet cannot help but cling to it. As old man Jake is telling this, right before the commercial, he says he's dying. But then right after that, he says he just meant that he's old and so dying is inevitable. Cheap commercial cliffhanger. I must confess to you, my love, that I'm dying to try one of these new muffins so that we may enjoy them together for the decades of vibrant life we'll have together. The topic eventually turns back to the subject of writing and why she hasn't done anything yet, reminding me of Terry Pratchett's comment on this subject. Quote, Successful writers don't pass the manuscript around to all their friends after they've done five pages. They get a grip on grammar, punctuation, and spelling. If they work in a genre, they read widely outside that genre. And they want to write. Too many people want to have written. The thing about writing is that it's something you know how to do already. I mean, it's like knowing how to bounce a ball, or how to throw a ball for that matter. But that doesn't mean you're LeBron James the first time you pick up a basketball, does it? Like with any skill, you have to practice it to get it better. The first time you write, you're probably going to suck. It's inevitable. You're learning, after all. But you have to get right back to it again and do it over so that this time you don't suck. You benefit from what you've learned and you can do the job right this time. Well, back to the plot. They had to soon turn the station over to the Klingons, so that would be the end of the search for Cisco. So Jake tried to move on with his life, getting married, starting his writing career, starring in Candyman. But then one day, Cisco appears in his living room, and after a quick and happy reunion, all Jake can think is how selfish it was to get on with his life when his father was trapped in a tech tech. So he abandoned his career to study tech enough to help, even though his obsession wound up driving his wife away. But they were able to set up a repeat of the accident on the Defiant, where the wormhole was about to burp again. Only instead of saving Cisco, Jake gets pulled inside of it. Fourteen years, his career, his marriage, all for nothing. And still he can't let go. But Cisco begs him to stop obsessing over him and get back to living his life. Old man Jake reveals that he has returned to his career, as Cisco asked him. But he's also understood what's happened as Sisko was trapped, frozen in time, and it was only his link to Jake from the accident as sometimes yanked him forward. So Jake will die at the right point. That's what he meant about dying. It was a double fake-out. Sending Sisko snapping back to the moment of the accident and give him a chance to live. And Jake a chance to live his life over again right this time. Because the first time he did it, he sucked at it. So he's going to go back and do it over again so he can do the job right. The Visitor is beautifully shot, skillfully performed, and finely crafted, so much so that poor Michael Taylor, who was new, was presumed to be a fictional persona made up by Michael Piller and or Jerry Taylor. The script was actually given an uncredited rewrite by Rene Echeverria. A first-person narration can have a profound impact on the emotional connection between the character and the audience, because we understand the character's thoughts even more intimately. Jake's story is one filled with a mixture of both hope and despair, a man who couldn't let go, as he said most people do, because it was never over for him. It kept returning, never letting him heal so that wound never closed. What he did was for the reason that he said, as much for himself as it was for his father, and an outstanding example of a Trek story using the science fiction element to explore the bond between father and son. A nice small part that we get in this episode is seeing Quark's true colors. He has nothing to gain caring about Jake now that Sisko was gone, and yet 
He was quick to suggest to Nog to knock off early to go to the hollow suite with Jake, passing on a potential profit just because it was the kind thing to do for someone who was hurting. It showed a different aspect to the character there. The episode also involves a what-if story, an alternate reality where there was no Ben Sisko to influence events, either directly or simply by being. This was before the Dominion War, back when the Klingons were in a new expansionist era, kicking the Cardassians' asses. The Bajorans took Sisko's death as a sign from the prophets that the Federation wasn't going to be the answer to their prayers, so they wound up allying with the Cardassians. It seems that because of this, something happened with Dukat. He either never brought back Zial, not finding her or just killing her, never rose above his demotion to running cargo, he died, or whatever it was, made sure that he didn't go rogue, and consequently never wound up making a deal with the Dominion. So while things were grim in this reality with the Klingons, in some ways, it could be argued things might just have been better, for the Quadrant anyway. Awards Time Days of Future Past a narration from the future about the past, which is mostly set in the show's present, but is all our future. Everybody got that? Death Loophole. On a physical level, Jake dying should have accomplished nothing. The matter that composed his body would go on. Yet, SF often seems to think that dying or breaking something is just good enough as far as those things go. Dimensional Lazarus. Killing himself resets time so Jake never dies. Nice trick if you can make it work. And finally, always awesome Tony Todd. That's our show. Next time, some old friends have come by for an unwelcome stay. 